My research is part of a collaborative project looking at different communities of interest and how they engage with a World Heritage Site, which is Ironbridge Gorge in Shropshire. Um, and I'm particularly looking at tourists and their role as active cultural producers of meaning and value in the co-construction of the values of this place. So this paper is an examination of a particularly dominant aspect of the tourism imaginary of Ironbridge Gorge. That is, that it is a rural site. Imaginaries, um, and I apologise if you all know this already, but they are um, realms of perception, visualisations and expectations about what a place is that are held in common throughout a large group of people. Tourism, ad tourism imaginaries thus encapsulate the many ways in which tourists perceive a site. They're influenced by marketing and so on, but are also constantly being recreated and changed by tourist-produced narratives such as traveller photos, reviews on TripAdvisor and portrayal in the media. Um, Affinodorus Cronus describes tourism imaginaries as being between the place and the story. So they are really fundamental, the sort of glue that sticks together how we experience place. Uh, but they are, of course, hard to pin down and study. Um, hopefully this paper will feed into some of the discussion earlier about fantasy of the rural <coughs> in, uh, in the Lake District and other places. So um, I'm looking at how a former industrial site has been transformed into an imagined and perhaps imaginary rural attraction. Um, the case study I'm using um, is Ironbridge Gorge in Shropshire. It's located in the west of England, um, between Birmingham and the Welsh border, and is today part of the new town of Telford. Uh, on the map of Telford, Ironbridge Gorge is down here. Um, and uh, prior to the establishment of Telford in the early 1960s, Ironbridge Gorge was one of the oldest parts of the East Shropshire coalfield. Physically, it is a steep-sided gorge on the River Severn and is home to a number of small settlements. This is a tourist map of the site, and I'll show you a physical one in a minute, um, because the site is also a major tourist destination and attracts around one million visitors a year to its ten museums and the gorge itself. Um, so you can see on here the location of different um, tourist nodes, I suppose, and the ways in which tourists are encouraged to move around the site. This is a slightly blurry, sorry, physical map of the site with the World Heritage Boundary overlaid on it. It is one of the UK's 30 World Heritage Sites um, and was inscribed on the basis of the survival of the 18th century industrial landscape and in particular the Colbrookdale glass furnace, which is located up here, and um, the Iron Bridge, which is down somewhere in the middle, around about there. Um, the blast furnace was where Abraham Darby I was able to produce coke smelted iron early in the 18th century, and the iron bridge was built later that century um, and was the first in the world to use cast iron in a structurally significant way. According to the Statement of Outstanding Universal Value, Iron Bridge is a world renowned symbol of the 18th century industrial revolution. This is a quote from the UNESCO documentation about the site. Um, saying um, the Ironbridge Gorge provided the raw materials that revolutionised industrial processes and offers an insight into the origins of the Industrial Revolution. The property contains substantial remains of mines, pit mounds, spoil heaps, foundries, factories, workshops, warehouses, ironmasters and workers' housing, public buildings, infrastructure and transport systems together with the traditional landscape and forests of the Severn Gorge. So, on paper at least, this is an industrial site. So it might come as a slight surprise to see how it is generally um, perceived. Um, one of the predominant aspects is that it is a rural site. Um, here are a selection of some typical headlines about the gorge from the last 30 years or so, um, and a sort of fairly typical tourist image of the site. I particularly like the one at the top, which is um, Hell on Earth is now a peaceful tourist attraction, which might not really fit with how locals perceive it on a busy bank holiday weekend. Um, I have stood on the bridge and I've listened to people talking about it and uh, heard somebody, or well, many people actually, use the term bucolic. Uh, it's the ruralness of Ironbridge today uh, which is so overwhelming and yet seemingly at odds with its history. So very briefly, I want to address the idea that Ironbridge was a particularly hellish place and is now completely lovely. Um, what I think these ideas encapsulate is a perceived dichotomy between historic industry and attractiveness. The notion that an industrial site is not the kind of place you would go on a day out, while the countryside, it seems, is. Actually, Ironbridge in the 18th century was not the desolate wasteland of fire and brimstone that people might like to imagine. 
It was one of the earliest places in England to experience the large-scale development of industry, and as such was something of a tourist attraction in the 18th century. We have loads of uh, travellers' tales and paintings. These are some that are actually more officially commissioned, um, but images of the gorge that give us an idea of what it was like. And it was actually at the heart of this movement in the industrial sublime, uh, when the aesthetic admiration of the grandeur of industry was emerging. The Iron Bridge was the pinnacle of this, a bright light of industrial innovation and progress that people from all over the world came to marvel at. Today we can look at the famous Colbert Dell by night image, which has come to sort of represent the Industrial Revolution in many ways, and think, wow, that looks really awful. Um, but at the time, it would have both horrified and, and seduced. And indeed, this image is, is a bit of an exaggeration. The artist was a set painter. It's, it's a sort of fantasy in itself. Um, what I think is much more significant in terms of thinking of Ironbridge as the antithesis of a rural idyll is the post-industrial decline, uh, which set in in the late 19th century and continued until the establishment of the new town in the middle of the 20th century. Um, this is where I think there's a useful concept um, about edgelands. Um, as has been discussed, there are more categories of space than simply urban and rural. The edgelands are spaces which can be found on the outskirts of our towns and cities, the municipal dumps, the old canals, the scrub woodland, on the edges of car parks, and notably in this case, the ruins of old industry. The environmentalist Marion Shord coined the term in an essay in 2002, but it is an idea that's been around for some time, most notably perhaps an early example in maybe the unofficial countryside in 1973. In this decade, these spaces have become a little bit more fashionable, and they become focus for urban explorers and uh, framed artistically into glossy black and white images. Um, they can be paradises for the psychogeographer determined to peek beneath the outer veneer of modern urban living and see what lies beneath. But despite this, even now, these spaces are often invisible, driven past quickly by day trippers heading out of the city in search of the real rural experience. For writers such as Farley and Simon Roberts, um, the Edgelands are in fact of truer reality of the spaces in Britain that are not in the centre of our cities. Um, and they argue that the picturesque rural so sought after by tourists is, is largely imaginary, or at least constructed and inauthentic. Um, there are some key aspects of the Edgelands that are worth highlighting briefly. Edgelands are forgotten places, or places for forgetting. They are invisible, so the eye just sort of slips past them, and they are fluid and constantly changing spaces. So these are some of the images of Ironbridge Gorge sort of in the early 20th to mid 20th century prior to the large scale regeneration of the site. Crucially, none of these things on that list are characteristics of a major tourist attraction and world heritage site. The epitome of conservation discourse, memorialisation memorial and visual attractiveness. So did Ironbridge ever really have a chance of being both a major heritage attraction? and remain as an edgeland site. In the 1950s, Ironbridge was in a serious and near terminal state of decline. The East Shropshire Coalfield was in its last days with industries closing either to move elsewhere or going out of business entirely. On top of that, the Ironbridge Gorge area was physically falling apart. You heard um, somebody reference Aberthan earlier in the 50th anniversary. This is the kind of thing that could very much have happened at Ironbridge. Um, the, the legacy of centuries of intensive extraction of coal, iron, limestone and clay was having a serious toll. It was an area that could certainly be considered edgeland, something that would have been even more apparent with the development of the new town of Telford, just to the north of it. So this is where Telford <coughs> comes in. Here are two maps of Telford in the 1960s. The first, on this side, is a map of the troublesome parts of the Telford area. Uh, that the development corporation had to deal with. It got disused mine shafts, spoil tips, and areas prone to landslip. The particularly colourful area down here, that's Ironbridge Gorge, so there's a lot of problems there. <laughs> um, on the other side, we've got the master plan sorry, uh, or, that was drawn up for the new town. Um, areas that are dark green or light green, as you can see largely concentrated down here, were areas for amenity and woodland planting. It was hoped that Ironbridge Gorge um, could become a, a tourist attraction, perhaps, um, of, and uh, would be an area of special amenity for the people of the new town. 
So we are in Ridge Rural. Um, it had to be changed as it wasn't a functioning livable space. There was a horrible accident where a teenage girl fell through the top of the ruins of Bedlam Furnace and was paralysed, even in the 1980s. Um, but even today, it's definitely not a rural site. We've got active industries, the Argyll Rayburn, sorry, I'm struggling with the late pointer, um, who are still actively producing iron. Um, there's lots of disused railway lines, industrial areas. It could still very much be considered an edgeland site. But when we look at the imagined conceptualisation of Ironbridge, we see something quite different. So before I go on to that very brief diversion into what I believe rurality is, and I'm sure we'll get lots more um, definitions today, um, according to Michael Woods, rurality is the condition of not being urban. Interestingly, Woods also states that rurality is a social construct rather than something absolute. Rurality exists insofar as people perceive it to exist and its characteristics are those attributed to it through representation. In this sense, Ironbridge, in tourism imaginaries, is definitely embracing rurality, characterised as a rural idyll, a place of peace and tranquillity set apart from urban life. The Visit Ironbridge website, which is at the top right-hand corner of the stage, um, is fairly typical of the type of thing um, officially produced to represent Ironbridge for tourists to consume. The bridge is often central to the representation of the whole site, used as an icon both for the gorge um, and for what it's supposed to represent, industrial progress and innovation, aesthetic beauty, and so on. Um, the text from the website, which I've quoted here, um, sort of implies that heavy industry is gone, that it was a place of industry, but is now a tranquil and beautiful place. As we've seen, the reality of this is that Ironbridge was considered to be highly aesthetic, even when it was a place of heavy industry. Um, so that's maybe a challenging thing to think about. Um, another aspect that emerges from analysis of the guidebooks and websites is one of nature reclaiming Ironbridge once again. This is a quote from one of the um, main guidebooks for the board, this idea of nature trying to reclaim the site. In this natural, the natural countryside seems to have a right of reclamation um, and is part of a struggle with the industrial remains. Um, and this is maybe um, a restoration of the natural order. It's seen as almost a right thing. Um, humanity's frail attempts to create something of permanence fight a losing battle against tree roots and wildflowers, which we'd like to take over once more. Tourist produced narratives um, appear to follow this largely. Um, if you search Ironbridge Gorge hashtag on Instagram, this is the kind of thing that comes up. Um, thousands of images, literally, of the tranquil river, of people eating ice cream uh, in front of the bridge. An idealised and largely rural image of Ironbridge comes through. Um, and the natural features of the gorge, with the exception of the bridge, um, really predominate. So lots of woodland and lots of flowers. Um, <coughs> an intriguing manifestation of some of these ideas expressed physically in the site is this wildflower meadow which has become a semi-permanent aspect of the public space management of the gorge in recent years. This image, which is one of my own, but it's pretty typical of um, the many taken of the bridge from that angle by tourists, uh, which you can find millions of on Instagram, um, it, it's, it shows you know, the bridge sort of framed by the flowers of the hills behind. It's taken away from the town, so the town behind the bridge is not included in any of the images. And I think the wildflower meadow represents a sort of rural trope, um, one that the performance of tourist photography will almost always seek to include if present. Although this is um, currently anecdotal, I haven't proved this yet, but I've got more research to do. Um, does it provide a marked contrast to the harshness of the Iron Bridge? Or perhaps more likely set the bridge, which is now so old and naturalised itself, into this kind of natural context of the gorge? Why has this happened? There are a couple of useful theoretical ideas which may shed some light. Um, Laura Jane Smith's notion of the authorised heritage discourse is one. Um, she argues um, that heritage is not, as is commonly portrayed, made up of old places and things, but it in fact is a pervasive form of cultural production, something which valorises the past and informs the commemorative performances of people in relationship to it. Um, building on this, Steve Watson developed the concept of the rural historic, 
um, a cultural construct which has permeated the production and experience of heritage tourism in England. It is associated with place myths of tranquil open spaces, cricket matches on village, village greens, castles rising out of the mist, elegant country houses and country cottages permanently draped within roses. Watson states that the rural historic is the product of the Industrial Re Revolution itself when a radical disconnect began to emerge between the England that people actually lived in, which was urban industrial, and the England of the imagination, which did not change with the development of industry. The rural historic is at the core of the way in which heritage tourism is promoted in England, which is presented as having an all-pervasive quaintness, populated, Watson says, with friendly police constables and district nurses on bicycles. Crucially, Watson asks how the cradle of industrial capitalism and urbanism has come to be defined by the historical imaginary imagery of its much diminished countryside. So where does industrial heritage fit in these conceptualisations of heritage? Watson um, did his work on the sort of parish church, it's not the, the great machines of the 18th and 19th century. But he could almost have been talking about Ironbridge when he referred to the cradle of industrial capitalism. He meant England as a whole, but um, the tagline of Ironbridge is that it is the birthplace of industry. Um, you can even meet a friendly police constable if you go to Blissville, Victorian town, who will smile and be in all your photographs. Um, it seems that, in this case at least, heritage and rurality are too closely linked from the more authentic, if we dare use that word, edgelands or de identity of the site to have survived in tourism imaginaries of it at least. Um, I would also add that leisure, which is a central aspect of tourism, is also often associated with the rural, while the city is structurally opposed as a place of work. It's not surprising, given all of this, that Ironbridge has become a quaint English village Bunting included, even though its primary claim to fame is its industrial past. Mm -hmm.